Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. Brianna Venosi is off. I'm Michael Hill. With an abnormal Thanksgiving behind us, the focus changed from gatherings at homes to gatherings at stores and malls. It is, of course, Black Friday, but much like Thanksgiving, there was a lot of uncertainty about what it would look like as cases surge in New Jersey and all around the country. Today, the state is reporting 4,100 new positive cases for a total of more than 326,000 cases. Health leaders report 19 more lives lost for a total of nearly 17,000 confirmed and probable deaths. And as of 10 o'clock Thursday night, nearly 2,800 patients were hospitalized with COVID. While many stayed in their own bubble for Thanksgiving, it appears people are not afraid to venture outside of that bubble for some holiday shopping. There may not have been hours-long waits in line, but retailers are still expecting a big boost to their bottom line as shoppers throw on a mask and hit the stores. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan spoke to shoppers about what differences, if any, they're seeing on a Black Friday altered by the pandemic. We're still here, we're here at 7 a.m. It's just, it's, it is weird that it's quiet. It's a little different. Black Friday bargain hunters defied the CDC's warning to avoid high-risk shopping at crowded malls today, but as they popped on masks to prowl the Paramus Park Mall in search of sales, they did notice the hand sanitizer stations. That spooked some people. You're petrified. <laughs> really? Yeah, you are. I mean, I, I get one more hand sanitizer as I walk around. I know there's a pandemic, but I still came out. People are still shopping, and life goes on. Hopefully, you know, healthy and safe, of course. Shopping restrictions during the pandemic took a toll at this mall. Clothing Emporium Justice advertised a going out of business sale. Several stores have already closed. This holiday's a make or break moment for many, and some markdowns top 60%. JB manages the everything embroidered kiosk. He says business is slow. It's not nowhere close to how it was last year or uh, last Christmas, last Thanksgiving. Like, I mean, you never know, December might get better. We saw that like Abercrombie is shut down and a lot of other places are shut down. So it's, it's, there's less crowds, obviously, because everyone's going online, but it's sad because the businesses are shut. To me, it feels so empty. It would be crowded by this point already. So I think people are shopping online, obviously, and protecting themselves. But this is a tradition for us, so we didn't want to forego it. Other venues did a brisker business. Dozens of shoppers lined up at Cherry Hills GameStop for hard-to-get next-gen gaming consoles. CBS reported the store had only seven to sell. Garden State Plaza also drew a decent crowd, some standing patiently in socially distanced lines or waiting at the pandemic-inspired curbside pickup station. Nationwide retail analysts estimate customers will spend upwards of $766 billion. Actually, some 40 percent started holiday buying during early sales more than a month ago. Oh, it's critical. As you know, Black Friday is the day that you're supposed to get back in the black after you've been in the red most of the year. So it is critical, and we're just hoping that everybody takes advantage of it. The National Retail Federation predicted sales for November and December could rise as much as 5.2% over last year. That's pretty optimistic, but the big shopping boom is expected to be online. Shoppers are expected to spend 20 to 30% more online this season. Meanwhile, local merchants hope folks will turn out for small business Saturday tomorrow and boost brick and mortar establishments. Montclair's rolling out the red carpet with free parking and music. It's a matter of survival, absolutely. This whole holiday season is. Um, you know, I was saying earlier, it was your civic duty at the beginning of November to vote. It is your civic duty now to go find your favorite small business and spend some money there. Already seeing closures walking around various municipalities and various towns in New Jersey. So we need 
everyone to get out and support local. The pandemic's killed more than 20 of Montclair's 250 small shops, but one not only survived, the eclectic chic boutique actually thrived by forging a formidable online presence to complement its in-store business featuring artist made one of a kind wares. I'm keeping it as flexible as possible that they can order from us online and they'll have lots of options. They can have their items held for pickup. We can drop it off right in their trunk. We, if they live local, we could drop it off right on their doorstep. The time frame short with Cyber Monday looming on the shopping calendar. In Montclair, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. For more on Small Business Saturday and shopping local and the important role it could play in keeping retail afloat this year, check out Rhonda Schaffler's interview with Al Titone. He directs the New Jersey District Office of the U.S. Small Business Administration. That's on our website at njspotlightnews.org. It's an added challenge in coping with restrictions of COVID-19. Those with developmental disabilities, unaware of the pandemic, don't quite understand why their freedom is being limited. It's a confusing time that can be a detriment to their mental health. Raven Santana explains. I often have said that our community is invisible that unless you were touched by this and you have somebody you know, um, it's hard for you to understand. Valerie Sellers, CEO of New Jersey Association of Community Providers, is referring to the community of 24,000 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities who receive help from the state. The reality is even the healthcare frontline staff, they're going in a million directions. They may not have the time to sit there and take three hours to feed Johnny because Johnny you know, needs help. Sellers says COVID has disproportionately impacted individuals suffering from intellectual and developmental disabilities. According to the Department of Human Services, as of November 22nd, there have been more than 1,000 cases and 95 deaths within the community. In the beginning, as everybody struggled, we were pretty much on our own. Challenges, how do you explain to somebody that you can't go see your friends in your day program, you can't go to work, and you can't see your family. I work very closely with individuals and families, and I can tell you to a person, people are working tirelessly to get this right. And it's a real balancing act, because on the one hand, you need to protect people's physical health, but on the other, you need to protect their emotional behavioral health too. Do you miss the Opportunity Center? Yeah. Huh? You miss your friends at the Opportunity Center? Yeah. Karen Petrillo is the mother of Keith Jake Petrillo, who is a developmentally delayed 33-year-old. Petrillo says her son was living in a group home in Demarest up until Thanksgiving, and that's when things took a turn for the worst. As of Thursday, uh, Thursday morning, if they came home with Thanksgiving, they had to go home on Thursday night and quarantine in their rooms for 14 days. And again, I went through this last night where he attacked me again last night. He doesn't understand why he's home, why he didn't go back. I feel that when they make these decisions, they really need to include the parents. Those tough decisions are shared by Joanne St. Amon, the guardian of her 65-year-old sister, Rosemary, who she describes as profoundly intellectually disabled and who cannot walk or talk. The testing is done once a week uh, for everyone. And I think that is really was very critical to to get things worked out in the centers and also to move forward visitation uh, protocol. President and CEO of Community Options, Robert Stack, says the biggest threat to families right now is underpaid employees. For example, a house where three people live and, and one of them contracted COVID and the staff have to go and take care of them every day. They're paid 13 or $14 an hour. If there's no one to take care of the people, we could have all the masks we want, but we're going to be in a bad situation. In response to the mixed reaction by advocates and providers, the Department of Human Services released a statement saying, these actions have not always been easy for residents or their families, but they have been important to protect the health and safety of those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we are thankful to all who are impacted by these changes for their understanding and their resilience. As always, the department will continue to take action to protect residents during the ongoing public health emergency. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. 
The restaurant business is trying to adapt once again to what the coronavirus is serving, how to still operate under indoor capacity restrictions that force outdoor dining to last another season or two in cold weather. The outdoor setup alone is not cheap and a race to survive the economic ravages of this pandemic. Joanna Gagas reports. If they can keep us open, that's that's the biggest thing right now. Restaurant tours like Ryan DePerzio are bracing themselves for a cold winter that could freeze out the clientele they've been working so hard to attract. It's causing many of them to think outside the box. We spent about $5,000 building uh, outdoor dining from tables to chairs to floral arrangements to the tent. I am trying to close this off a little bit um, where there's still some flow going through. These are burlap, if you can see. Um, but I'm also going to put some heaters in here, some electric heaters, and then I'm actually building a greenhouse. So I'm going to have up today um, a six foot by six foot greenhouse that'll fit four people. And uh, we're going to heat that as well. He's had to figure out a different game plan for each of his three restaurants. My other two restaurants, Kitchen Step in Jersey City and Botello in Jersey City, we have heaters. So that's been very helpful and we're building actually six greenhouses. Um, at Kitchen Step. Bill Spitz invested in heaters for his Jersey City restaurant, but says the wind off the Hudson River renders them useless once it gets too cold. So he found an alternative, dining tents or bubbles, as they're sometimes called, that's kicked off a trend in Jersey City. Each one of these is 10 feet in diameter, which is about how much space I was giving people before. I can fit a party of four to six inside. Uh, but we're happy if you're just one or two. Infectious disease specialist Stephanie Silvera says ventilation is key. If you have a tent, at least two sides should be open. Uh, those dining bubbles really should only be used by parties of people who live together. You're, if you're in a bubble and you're eating a plastic bubble with people that you don't live with, you're actually increasing your risk because there's less ventilation in those um, igloos. But to Spitz, it's not just about protecting his customers. The real benefit to this is the additional amount of protection it gives my staff. Adapting has become a new normal for restaurateurs and the changes aren't all bad. Spitz says these bubbles may come out again next year even if life returns to normal. Actually, they've been great. <laughs> no, they've attracted a lot of attention. And business. DePerzio got creative by offering preset meals and catering services, and that'll help keep him running if restaurants have to close to the public this winter. Weddings in backyards, you know, uh, engagements, baby showers. Now they, they made uh, recently indoor uh, gatherings to 10 people. People are, are hiring me to do 10 person dinner parties. So not just rolling with the punches, but like creating new outlets to bring in new revenue. If the numbers keep trending up, the state's going to have to make some tough decisions. I do think that if the numbers continue at the rate that they are, um, which has been accelerating, we may need to consider closing indoor dining again, yes. If that happens, Spitz is confident he'll survive. A uh, combination of takeout, delivery, uh, and freakishly warm days. Like today. In Jersey City, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Based on state guidelines, schools in all 21 New Jersey counties should consider all remote education. The state updated its COVID activity report, placing all counties at orange level, indicating high COVID activity. With many schools already having to switch to remote classes, educators are asking, will the state still test to evaluate student learning in the spring? The biggest teachers union says, don't do it. The year's been too chaotic. The Murphy administration's new acting education commissioner says the testing will go on. Education writer John Mooney joins us to sort this out. Thanks for joining us, John. How are they going to sort all this testing stuff out? Well, I think it's a little bit of a waiting game, though. They can't really take too long because schools have to start uh, preparing for this. I think a big wild card is what's going to happen on the federal level with uh, Joe Biden coming in and, and what kind of policies they'll take. Because right now, New Jersey implements these tests in part because the federal government requires them. Um, and they have for the last few years. The one change, of course, was in the spring where the federal government did allow states to, to uh, skip them for the first time in my memory, uh, as long as these tests almost have been, been given. But I think uh, right now the department, the State Department is saying we're moving ahead with them in the spring and uh, keep planning on it unless you hear otherwise. John, th there's concern, though, that students have regressed academically. Is that a fear in, in part of the equation here where people are saying, you know what, hold off in the spring for this kind of testing? 
Well, I, in fact, I think that's a, a big argument for the testing is to really see how well uh, schools have uh, been able to keep these kids on track. And, and it's a big fear. And, and there's been some pushback um, from uh, State Senator Teresa Ruiz, the chairman of the Senate Education Committee, who has said that there needs to be assessments because we're we're going to lose these kids if we don't uh, at least start building some data around how well they're doing, and she's also asked for the state to do a study of their of the of what's happening, and that would include some assessments. So um, I think there's a bunch of uh, pieces of this equation that we're going to see sort out in the next few months, probably not weeks, but months. John, quickly here, this other part that we're talking about today is the state data showing that and kind of advising that schools, all of them, all 21 counties should go remote because of the high COVID numbers. Yeah, they, the state keeps a, what they call an activity chart of every county in terms of uh, how high their numbers are. And, and part of it looks like all counties now have moved into this orange zone, which does say that they should consider going all remote. Um, I think personally, they're already thinking about going remote. I mean, I think that's that's something un, under consideration. The big question is when these things start moving into this red zone, uh, whether the state will order them to go remote. And that's not something that Governor Murphy has been inclined to do as yet, at least in the fall. So we'll, you know, lots of eyes on these numbers, obviously. John Mooney, our education writer there. Thank you, John. Thank you, Michael. For more on how the state plans to handle the statewide evaluations in the era of COVID, check out John's full story at njspotlightnews.org. Big concerns about vaccines for protection against the coronavirus, the chief medical officer of Holy Name Medical Center, Dr. Adam Jarrett, warns they will not be a silver bullet. That's what he writes in his book, In the Time of COVID. I spoke to him about that and more. Dr. Jarrett, as you write, you say that this was not your first pandemic. You got your medical training at New York Hospital during the AIDS crisis, the AIDS pandemic. And you write, I'm going to read the specific quote you have here. I was haunted by the similarities, patient sick, scared, and alone, as you compare AIDS to COVID-19. So patients were alone for different reasons. Patients are alone for COVID-19 because their families can't visit. And we tried very much, and, and I think we're fairly successful using electronic modes of communication, but that can't replace the face-to-face -face communication that is really an important part of a patient's recovering. During the AIDS epidemic, in my experience, patients were often alone because they were in relationships often with people that the rest of their family would not approve of. Regrettably, for the significant other and the patient, there were multiple situations and, I, and they break my heart thinking about them where parents who I guess thought, were, thought they were doing the right thing were doing the wrong thing and they had the significant others removed from um, being involved in their loved one's care, which was heartbreaking. Uh, you're talking about new diseases and you say evolving lessons. Uh, do not blindly accept guidelines, especially when working with a new disease. What do you mean by that? So this is a tough conversation because I, I'm very proud of the work that the CDC does in this country. But I have to be frank, I think there are times that we need to look at what the CDC is saying and make sure that it applies to our situation. So I go back in the book and I talk about the Ebola crisis. Now, thank goodness the Ebola crisis did not become a major issue here in this country. But if you look at what the CDC recommended initially for PPE for Ebola, to be frank, it was wrong. It was inadequate. And so we learned a major lesson. And that major lesson is look at the guidelines, learn about them, but make sure they apply. In this situation, the CDC has changed its recommendations and guidelines. And I don't believe they do that with any bad intent. I believe they make decisions for what they know at the time, and then they potentially alter their guidelines. And to be very frank, it doesn't always apply to the clinical situation. You write in the book about vaccines. It is unlikely that a vaccine will be the silver bullet we are all hoping for there. I said it, you're right. I think I really talk hard in the book about the fact that the fact that no medicine, including vaccines, should be accepted blindly. Whenever you look at a medicine, you have to wear, compare the risks versus the benefits. And unfortunately, we've had some situations in this country where the vaccine that was used, and I talk in the book about the 1976 um, swine flu pandemic, where that vaccine was a debacle. And I think we scared people. I, I'm very impressed with what's happening with this 
vaccine. And I do not think we're going to have that type of issue. And I encourage people to get the vaccine when it's available. But I think between the two issues, when the vaccine becomes available and a reluctance on people's part to take it, we are still going to have an awful lot of people die. And I say it in the book, I think that sadly, hundreds of thousands of more Americans will likely die from this pandemic. And if you compare that with just wearing a mask, which is safe, which works, and which likely could save many of those people who will die between now and when a vaccine is available, I can't stress enough the importance of wearing those masks. And I am frustrated, as I know most healthcare professionals are, with people who've taken masks and politicized them and, and turned them into something more than what they are, which is just our currently best prevention for COVID-19. Dr. Adam Jarrett is the Chief Medical Officer of Holding a Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's just written a book, In the Time of COVID. Dr. Jarrett, thank you so much. Michael, take, take care and stay well. Hazard pay is on the way for nearly 50,000 ShopRite workers in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut for working in the first wave of the pandemic. That's thanks to a new agreement between ShopRite and the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. The grocery store workers will get $1 for each hour worked between July 26th and August 22nd as a lump sum. Union leaders say the deal recognizes the risks grocery store workers have faced on the front lines of the pandemic and that ShopRite has agreed to meet with local unions to discuss additional hazard pay if non-essential businesses are forced to once again shut down. You can find all the daily COVID-19 numbers with interactive graphics, breaking news and resources about the coronavirus on a special section of our website. Head to njspotlightnews.org and click on the coronavirus tab. The pandemic has tossed a curveball at just about everything in society, including our utilities. For big companies like PSEG, a lot of decisions had been made and still need to be made about the day-to-day -day operations and much more, including keeping the energy flowing even when families cannot afford their bills right now. President and CEO Ralph Izzo spoke to Rhonda Schaffler about that and more. Ralph Izzo, President, CEO, and Chairman of PSCG, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for having me, Rhonda. It's great to see you. You know, of course, all across the state, our companies have been impacted by COVID-19. How has the pandemic impacted you at PSCG, and how are you still able to keep your capital plan intact during these very difficult times? Yeah, we're no exception, Rhonda. We've been affected in numerous ways. Uh, operationally, of course, having to change some of our work practices. I won't bore you with the details of that, but trying to not mix crews, making sure that half of the workforce that is capable of working from home is doing so. So there's been a whole slew of operational effects. It's made keeping the capital program going a little bit more of a challenge, but thank goodness for the talent of our employees, they're able to do that. It's also had an effect on us financially. Our customer payment patterns are off. Our receivables are twice what they would normally be at this time because of the economic impact it's had on our customers, who of course we have tremendous empathy for and are eager to work with them to help them uh, find their way out of this challenge. Uh, and we do of course have, uh, the governor asked for a moratorium on utility shutoffs. So I'm assuming um, once that get ends, uh, there'll be some sorting out on that end too. That's, that's correct, Rhonda. We, we actually, and of course, Governor Murphy was right to call for that. Uh, I don't mean to pat us on ourselves on the back, but we, we volunteered to do that even before any such announcement was made. But nonetheless, uh, the, the governor is always concerned about uh, those who are less fortunate than others and their ability to make ends meet. But your point is an important one. Uh, people shouldn't misconstrue a moratorium with the forgiveness of payments. So we are encouraging customers to contact us so we can help them to help themselves. There are government programs that are available to assist with, uh, with bill payment and things of that nature. Right? We don't want folks to dig such a hole that it becomes a long-term project to get out of it. And, and, and of course, we'll work with them. We, we fully understand the circumstances that they're faced with. So you are at the same time preparing for the future and part of your capital plan has to deal with modernization, has to do with resiliency. How is this going to translate into service improvements for your customers? Well, you know, what motivates us is sustainability. 
And sustainability comes across in at least three, if not many, many more dimensions. It's environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and how we govern ourselves. So we're looking at all kinds of improvements, as you said, replacing equipment that's literally 100 years old and has done more for us than we should have ever expected it to do for us, as well as investing in new technology that can improve the customer experience. Many customers find it hard to believe that today, even with today's technology, if their service is interrupted, we don't know that unless they call us. So we're, we're working with the Board of Public Utilities to change that technology so that, so that we know before a customer calls us that they're out of service. And we're working on improving the quality of our pipes and our wires so that we don't leak natural gas, so that our electrical grid is more resili resilient in the face of major storms. We are greatly motivated by our fundamental belief that climate change is real and we need to uh, do things to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. But given the trajectory we're on as a society, we also need to adapt to it to a certain extent. Lisa, thank you for educating us on everything that's been going on with the company. We really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you for having me again, Rhonda. Thank you. Support for the Business Report is provided by ELEC and Operating Engineers 825, repairing our critical infrastructure and building our recovery. Learn more at elec825.org. That's our broadcast for this evening. I'm Michael Hill, in for Brianna Venosi. For the entire news team, we hope you had a great holiday week, and we wish you an even better weekend. We'll see you next week. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.